things. Just a second here. Let me get to the right thing. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep. So what we're looking at here is the uh, managed collection form. And the way you get to this form is through managed data, metadata, and managed collection. Um, once you select that, you'll get a little drop down with um, the collections that you have access to if you have managed collection. Um, and you can pick them, whichever one you want to work with. So what I wanted to do today was first of all, talk about why this page is important um, and to kind of go through the fields on it and give a kind of quick overview of what they do. So the reason this form is important, especially for new collections, is that the data that gets entered into this form can be used to create an EML file. And an EML file is a special kind of text file that gets used um, at VertNet and by some of the other aggregators as well to bring your collection metadata into the aggregator. Um, so for brand new collections, once they're ready to publish to the aggregators, completing this form is the first step in that process. Um, for those of you who are already published to aggregators, um, this form can also be important and will eventually become very important because um, at some point, hopefully in the near future, you'll be able to make updates here, export your new EML, send that to VertNet and have it uh, populate the uh, metadata there as well. So instead of having to change it here, change it there, change it at GBIF, change it at GR Cycle, at some point, in the hopefully very near future, the only place you'll need to maintain it is here. That's not the case right now, but that's the goal. So if you've been in Arctos for a long time and you haven't looked at this page in, I don't know, 10 years, it's probably time to give it a little review, uh, make some updates and um, have, it, have it look nice. So the other thing about this form is everything that um, you see on this form that is public will also appear on your portal page. So I'll give you a preview of that later. Um, but now let's just kind of uh, breeze through these fields really quickly. So the first three here, your GUID prefix, your collection type, and your institution acronym, those are set at the time you create your collection in Arctos. Um, and there's been very, very, very rare occasions when one of these items has changed, but it's not recommended um, because these things become part of your uh, catalog record URLs, which are a globally unique identifier. So you don't want those to change once they're set. That's why they're gray, you can't change them. Um, the rest of the fields can be changed, um, but some have cautionary tells with them. And one of these is institution. So this is the name of your institution. And um, it's used to group things on the portal page. So if you have 10 collections, so for instance, UTEP here, if they have 10 collections and nine of them say University of Texas at El Paso Biodiversity Collections with UTEP in parentheses, but the 10th one doesn't have the UTEP in parentheses, um, they are gonna sort differently. So if you are managing multiple collections for an institution, you probably wanna make sure that um, this institution name is the same on all of them. And by the same, I mean exactly the same. Next is your uh, collection, which is a very brief description of what the collection is. These are pretty standard. And when you go to the portal page, you can see what other collections of the same type have used. So almost all the herbaria, say plant specimens, um, all the mammal collections, same mammal specimens. So they're very brief and pretty standard, but you can change them. You don't have to be the same as everybody else. Next is your default cataloged item type. Um, these all come from the code table for cataloged item type. There's, I don't know, maybe uh, seven or eight different choices. 
What this does is when you enter a new catalog record, if you do not specifically select a catalog item type, this is what's going to go into that field, which is required for every catalog record. Um, it's kind of nice for biological collections, especially um, to have this selected and just let it roll. Next is your loan policy URL. Um, this is one that especially collections who've been around for a while should probably look into. Um, it would allow anybody coming into Arctos who's, saying, who's doing a download and maybe saying, I would like to borrow some specimens, a quick way to get to your specific um, loan policy. So um, most of the newer collections have a nice loan policy that's online, this URL works, but there are, especially in the older collections, um, some of these URLs are kind of to nothing or to a page that doesn't really have a loan policy. So I would encourage everyone to A, make sure they have a loan policy, B, publish it somewhere, and you can do that by uploading it to TAC and using the TAC URL um, if, if that's the best way to do it and making sure that that URL is here. Next is your catalog number format. Um, this can be changed, but you should not do it um, unless you think very carefully about it, um, especially if you're changing from uh, something that's like prefix integer suffix to integer um, that can really cause havoc. So this is set at the beginning. I recommend everybody stick with what they've got. If you want to change it for some reason, I also recommend having a discussion with uh, maybe the working group before you do that. Next up, web link URL. So this is, you know, your maybe museum site, or maybe you have specific um, sites for your various collections. This just lets people learn more about your collections. And then there's the text that goes with it. So if you provide nothing here, what will appear on the portal page is just the link. If you provide text here, this text will be the hyperlink to that. Then your various licenses. So you have your internal and external. Um, these are um, useful, the, the internal one, especially when people download data from Arctos, they're going to get this license, whatever you provide here. Um, most collections use CC BY or BY, and I think that's appropriate, um, although we've had definitely had people tell us uh, you can't really do that because you're just, you know, providing facts and it should be CCO. But um, CC BY encourages people to um, cite your data, and I think that's a good thing. Same for the external license. This is once your data leaves and goes to GBIF, what kind of license are you offering there? And then you have your collection terms. Most of the collections are using Arctos um, data ownership and use, and all these are, are really um, sort of community norms. If you're using our data, here's what we expect of you. Um, there's a few collections that have their own terms. If you um, or your museum does have its own terms, but you're using Arctos data ownership, you might want to consider um, adding your own terms and using those here. Um, and that's a code table request if you want to do that. Then your, there's your taxonomy sources. Uh, don't know some of the older collections, I think, still aren't fully aware of the ability to pick multiple sources and order them. Um, I think the newer collections get that, but the older ones still may not know. So for um, plants, for now, there's kind of only one, although there are plants in the worms via Arcto source, so you might want to select that first. But basically what's going to happen with the sources you select is on your catalog record, when you identify something with a name, um, the classification that appears under the name will come from the first source in the list you select that it finds. So if there's, if you had worms and then Arctos plants, if it found a classification in worms, it would use that. If it didn't, it would go down to plants and use that. If it doesn't find one there, you're not going to get a classification at all. Um, and there's reports to help you find those kinds of things as well. 
uh, GenBank collection. If you have uh, registered with GenBank, which we still haven't, I still haven't figured out the exact process for that. Apparently it's email somebody at GenBank, but um, if you do have a, a, a prefix that's registered at GenBank, putting it there will help you discover things that get submitted to GenBank, but that you aren't aware of yet. Then you have your collection description. It's nice to write something um, meaningful here that helps people understand generally what is in your collection. Um, and then your citation. So um, right now, I think most of the institutions have a citation like this one where it's just your institution name, potentially um, with the addition of the collection name. Um, I think as a community, we need to start talking about this citation um, use because if we were to select something more machine readable, um, we might be better at finding citations of our collections, which right now um, I think using these different sort of uh, verbose descriptions it can sometimes catch things and sometimes not. So this will be something to keep an eye on in the future because I think we will be talking about using something more standard for a citation. Then there's your geographic description. So this is just a textual description of the geographic coverage of the collection. Um, it can be fairly long and it's nice to put as much detail there as you can because then next you have your coverage coordinates. So for some collections, um, filling these in makes sense if you have something very specific. So for instance, it's every, all of our collection is from the state of New Mexico, then you could easily put your four corners of a polygon in here um, and help people understand um, from a geographic standpoint where your things were collected. Um, for a lot of collections, though, um, it's kind of a global, you've got a global search area, so just leaving it blank is fine as well. Then you have general taxonomic coverage. So again, textual, just kind of generally, um, this is plants, or these are plants that, you know, of a specific family or whatever, something that helps people see what you've got. And then there's your rank and name value. Um, this is a little difficult for some collections, um, for instance, invertebrate collections that might cover a lot, um, but you can um, use comma separated name values in the name value field. So maybe you want to use order and pick, you know, five orders or something like that. Um, but it's important that the taxon name values be actual um, taxonomic names. This all gets passed on to GBIF and it really does get used at the aggregator level. So it's kind of important to fill those in um, as best you can. Purpose of collection, most of ours are education and research, but you may have other things you wanna put there. Um, it's, it's up to you. And then we have alternate identifiers. So here um, at UTEP, We've put in two, um, and I think at some point we may have to start thinking about having more than two um, because there's our identifier for the portal, which maybe should become our citation. That's one of the things we'll probably have to talk about. But then there's also our um, data set ID at VertNet. Um, and in addition to this, uh, GBIF provides a DOI for this data set. So um, that would be another one that you could add here as well. But right now we only have space for two. So that's what we've got in here. Your preservation methods, a comma separated list. Um, for many collections, there's just two or three. If you have a lot more, you can just keep on uh, adding them. And then your time coverage. So this is just text kind of saying, beginning and end dates of when these things were collected. Anything you edit here, you have to hit save changes or it won't get saved. So make sure if you edit stuff, you, you hit that button. On the right-hand side of this page, 
Angie, you got a question? I do. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that you're going through all this Um, because I haven't really looked too closely. I want to confirm your time coverage. That is the dates during which the collection was assembled, not the dates of which your objects were made, created, since we've got things that are outside of, you know, that 19, you know, the, the dates of our museum, essentially. Right. Well, so I do think this will be different for cultural and biological collections. So for biological collections, it's, it's expected to be the assembly dates, right? These were collected beginning whenever and ending whenever, or it's continuing. But for you, I think it would be important to um, maybe offer up both, right? Um, you know, objects that were created starting in whenever, um, but they were collected starting in whenever. It seems like that would be appropriate. Um, okay. Probably something that will get dictated by your community when they start aggregating things, right? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, any other questions? Is that it for now? Um, on the right hand side here, we have uh, contact information. And one thing that has happened over the course, especially of the last year, is we've added some new contact roles. And so I know a lot of the collections don't have names associated with those roles. And I would encourage everybody to go and look. And you can see all the different roles here or you can go to the code table, um, but that for each role, you have at least one contact. You can have more than one, but having at least one is a good thing um, because the roles get used for different kinds of communications from Arctos um, and for us to help assemble, for instance, members of the working group or who do we contact about a, a billing these all these contacts are important for that. So please review them, make sure you have at least one for each and make sure that those contacts are people who um, really are responsible for those things. So that if we go and ask somebody a question, we're asking the right person. And then under that, we have some, a little bit of um, catalog record magic that you can do. And so, uh, most collections I think have taken advantage of the header image, um, but maybe not so much the header color um, or potentially using uh, your own CSS, the style sheet down here um, to make your header look a little different. So if anybody's interested in that, if you maybe still just see the Arctos bear when you're looking at your catalog records and you'd prefer to see your institution logo and maybe have the color change from gray to, you know, whatever your, your preferred color is, um, just ask for help. File an issue in GitHub, um, or you can play with it yourself. Just changing these things um, will change the color. If you don't like it, you can change it back. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't break anything if you change a header color. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for the manage collection page. One thing that I wanted to show everybody is what happens to this information when it leaves Arctos. So. Um, we just went through this UTEP uh, plant managed collection. And if you go to look at their data set on GBIF, you can see how some of this comes into play. So the description that they gave shows up here in the GBIF description. Um, yeah, right here, um, your geographic scope, ports over, taxonomic scope, contacts port over um, specific, some of the specifics from the, um, from the host get stuck in there. So VertNet puts their own um, information into the EML when it gets there um, and then um, adds the citation. And so at GBIF, you can see the citation they use is, um, it has their DOI that they provide. So um, it's something that maybe every collection should monitor is, you know, what's happening with this DOI? Are there publications 
um, are citing that because that means people are using your data from GBIF. Um, so it's, it's one thing to keep an eye on. It's also interesting to visit this page for your collections and look at your metrics and activity as well um, to help you get an idea of what's happening when your stuff leaves Arctos. Uh, so I didn't uh, go over how data gets from Arctos to Vertnet to GBIF um, and then also the um, instance of GR cycle, which is separate from your GBIF registration. Hopefully at some point, those two things are gonna become one. Um, but right now, any changes that you make with GBIF, you also need to make with GR cycle um, and vice versa. So if you have any questions about any of those things, um, if you're looking at getting your metadata updated across the board um, and need to, understand the process, feel free to post an issue and get asked for help um, because sometimes it does take a little help from Dave Bloom or even sometimes somebody at GBIF to help get everything absolutely correct. So, so that's managing a collection. I hope everybody will leave here and go check out their managed collection page and update it to the best of their ability. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, uh -huh. I'll also add there is a webinar for um, that's already been recorded on how Arctos data does make its way through the VertNet IPT into GBIF. So feel free to peruse our YouTube station and check that out. Um, do we have any last questions on managed collection before we move on to the new data entry screen? Uh, hi, Teresa. This is Carla. I just have a comment. I, maybe I missed it, but. Another important thing about managed collection is things like loan contacts is how Arctos sends loan reminders for overdue loans. Um, and also the data quality context is how annotations might get submitted. So I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah, each one of those contacts has um, very specific um, information that they might receive, right? So all of them should have a good email address in their agent and in their um, Arctos user profile, because Carla's right. So for loans, loan notifications will go to that contact and um, for annotations, the data quality person will get information. Um, the administrative contacts can get billing information. So it's really important to have somebody in there for each one of them. Great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see the search page? I'm assuming yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and navigate to data entry. And um, so if you haven't been here for a while, it's going to look a little bit different, this landing page. So I'll just kind of orient us first. So you can still at this point in time navigate to the old data entry form or the classic form, um, but as is noted, there are a growing number of limitations. So for instance, right now, um, UTM coordinates aren't able to be entered through this form. You can't add a lot of extra fields um, as you can in the newer form. So the plan is to slowly transition folks to the new form. So um, hopefully after this session, you'll feel a bit more comfortable using the new form. Um, there's a summary of recent changes. And so we'll walk through all of these. Um, but if you're ready to go ahead and start data, you'll have a few options. So first you can begin with a profile and um, you'll see some people have already created profiles with this new form. Um, I'll walk through how we create a profile, so I'll leave that be for now. Um, but just as before, you can enter, you can start with your last entered record by clicking this hypertext. You can also start with a previously entered record, meaning any record that you have hanging out in the bulk loader. Um, you can go ahead and, and grab and start entering from that. The select any previously entered record if you have sufficient access, that's going to be if you have managed collection permissions. So if you have other folks um, on your team who've entered records, you can also 
grab anything out of the browse and edit screen and, and work from there. But you can also just begin with a blank slate. So I'm going to go ahead and just pick a collection type to start with. And so um, if it's your first time ever checking out the new form, you're actually probably going to see the table view first. And so this table view is going to roughly mimic the old data entry form minus that nice green background. Um, but you'll see kind of these data table blocks in um, two columns, and they're going to follow that ordering that most of us uh, are familiar with. But you'll also see, if you scroll down, there's the ability to add some extra fields to all of these table blocks and the ability to customize. And so I'm going to kind of walk through these, but I'll go to the dynamic view because this is a new feature. Um, so the cool thing with this new form is that we have all of our tables, but they can be dragged anywhere you want. So you can arrange your data entry form um, to whatever sort of organization makes sense for you, whether that's just uh, what makes sense uh, or aesthetically or in your, in your mind, the best workflow. But also you can align these different tables to maybe you are cataloging from a ledger. And so you can organize them in the order that maybe your columns are in your written ledger. Um, so that's kind of a handy feature. And then um, if you're feeling like lost because these are all in a sort of random order, there is a handy toolbox here where there's a lost and found. And so you're like, where do I enter agents now? Um, I can just click that and that little block will get highlighted and fade um, from red to, to white again. And so uh, you can easily just kind of navigate by clicking on each table and that will get highlighted so you can easily find where you are. So we'll talk about customize options. So customize has actually always been around, but unless if you've really explored it. Oh, Andrew, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, is there a way to, once you've rearranged things, to have them lock into alignment? That yes. issue makes me frenetic, so that's why yes. I like the grid view. <laughs> oh, lock, auto lock into alignment or just save? Um, so that you they, know. you know, so yeah, so that all your things aren't like floating yes. out of line. <laughs> Yeah, so we will basically save this as a profile. And so once you've kind of tweaked to your heart's desire, you can go ahead and lock that and that's how they will stay. But they'll stay in whatever visual alignment that you've placed. There's not a way to, once you get them ordered, to have like a left alignment for all of these things that are on the left or across the top or create no. in that order. No, it'll okay. be kind of you kind of fiddling around, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so these customized buttons have actually always been in the data entry screen, but if you didn't, if you haven't explored them before, they're really handy. So if I just click on that, you'll notice that all the fields that are in whatever table you're working on are displayed here. And so right now they're all defaulting to show, meaning that we can see all the fields, they're all visible, but you can go ahead and actually look at different um, options. So for instance, if I click on this associated species, I've got the options to show, carry, or hide um, this field. So we'll just kind of start with carry. And when you select carry, that means, and save the setting, that means that what I put in this field um, is going to get carried over. So once I actually populate this full record and save as a new record, preserve specimen, that value will be carried over. Um, so this is really handy, especially if you're having repeated values. So maybe you're working through a large accession and everything was, you know, the same collector uh, brought in the specimens, or maybe you have the same locality information that's getting repeated. You can go ahead and customize um, all of these different tables and have those values carry over. So that can be really handy. Um, another option is hide. And so, um, you know, maybe there's something you just don't really tend to use, a field that you might not um, use very often. So you can go ahead and just select hide and save settings, and those will go away. And so that kind of just tailors uh, your data entry screen to what you want to see and can be especially helpful for if you have newer 
folks working in the data entry form um, so that there's just a little bit less noise. So for instance, parts, I know I personally am never going to enter 10 parts. So I can go ahead and just hide um, a lot of these fields. So if you click on customize and go all the way over, um, you can actually hide entire rows all at once rather than kind of toggling each of these menus. So I'm just gonna hide everything and then maybe just show two parts, save, and that's just going to kind of take away the fields I don't need. Uh, there's the option to further customize. So, you know, here at UCM, we're not in the barcode era. So I'm just gonna hide all of these things. But I'll have, I'll just kind of note that you cannot hide anything that is required. So, so if we go and see accession, the only options are show or carry. So uh, that's kind of a great sort of quality control. You're never going to be hiding uh, required fields. Um, another thing I want to point out is in attributes. So for those of you who manage bird and mammal collections, there's a little helper menu. And so if you select that, it's going to actually give you the standard measurements for birds and mammals. Um, and let me just move my parts now down. And so you'll see I just had the mammal helper. So I see all my standard measurements. And there, these do come with a note of caution. Um, so anytime you're populating these standard fields, they will overwrite these first six fields. So they basically correspond to these fields. So for instance, if I have a female, it's going to um, shoot those values into those first six fields. So if you are populating more than six attributes, you should just either start with your standard measurements or actually just start six fields, fields down so that you're not overwriting what you've just entered. Um, and then I'll talk about extras. So down here is where I've kind of put my extras. And so these are what they sound like. They give you the ability to add additional fields on top of what's already visible. And so in the case of identifiers, so up here or attributes right here, you can just simply add more fields. So for identifiers, you have the ability to add an additional five um, sets of fields. And with the case of attributes, you have the ability to add, uh, let's see, pull that up again, up to 10 additional um, on top of these fields. Carol, do you have a question? Yes, hi, thank hey. you. Um, I had a question. So the six fields, those, those only appear automatically that attributes if you're doing bird or mammal. Like I'm looking yes. at my herp one and I don't see that. Yep. So, yeah, okay, so so I should just customize it for whatever I want. For whatever um, you want, yep, exactly. And, and then this is sort of a dumb question, but once you customize your whole data entry thing and hit save, then that's sort of saved for you forever, right? Yes. Yes, yep. okay. So yeah, we just we'll have walk, to go through the torture through once. Okay, okay, <laughs> <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Your tweaking isn't for not, so you'll you'll be able to save everything and lock it in. Um, Can I ask a question to Emily? Sure. Go to if you ask. You're cutting out, Carla. Hmm. Carla's in the. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. yes. There okay, we go. Sorry. Yeah, when you add an extra identification, um, can you look at that? So how do you specify which is the valid one? Because what we often do is we have a field ID and then we'll identify the subspecies, you know, so we'll have two IDs. So, and the, the one with subspecies is the one we want is the accepted one. So how do you specify that? Yeah, so, yep, I'm just about to walk through that right now. So basically, yeah, in the case of identifiers and attributes, you're just simply adding more of what's there already in terms of fields, but identification, so the Carl is asking, so right now, if we look at this, we've got kind of the standard identification fields, but um, if let's say we wanna add an additional identification, we actually are gonna add a few extras. So um, all of a sudden we'll get the um, option to add publication sensus, Packs on concepts, and then this accepted flag, which Carla is getting at. So I just added that. It kind of goes wherever. So you can go ahead and drag it wherever you'd like. Um, but basically, all of a sudden, we get this accepted flag, yes or no. And so that way, um, 
you can basically have two identifications and one's going to be accepted and one will be not accepted, meaning that you're building that ID history. So I actually have a record pulled up here um, that displays that. So here for the snake, you can see originally it was just determined to genus and then um, a curator was able to get a species determination. So basically that flag right here maps um, right here. And so when something's not accepted, it's gonna go lower in that um, display. And then the yes accepted status will be the first name displayed. And so that's really handy because before you were not able to add sort of that determination history from data entry, you'd have to do a separate kind of bulk load step or get the record in Arctos first and then add that. Um, so this is a really handy tool. Does that answer your question, Carla? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Very yeah. exciting. Yeah, very exciting. And um, it's also really nice because you can have more than one agent who's the determiner. So a lot of times if there's an expedition or something, you don't actually know um, who did the who placed the ID, you can just name everyone. Um, and then, so, let's see, oh, I should mention locality attributes. So um, these aren't kind of part of the typical place time stack, but let's just um, show one of these. These are gonna be more relevant for if you are managing um, fossil collections. So you can see there's all sorts of stratigraphy options, um, as well as uh, township section range, PLS data. Um, so you have the ability to add all that information. I'll just put that right there. And then um, parts. And so this is a really nice feature as well. Um, so right now, you know, we've got our parts. I did kind of lob off eight of the 10 parts here. So I'm only displaying two, but Part extras allows you to actually add, um, I think up to 20 more parts, but also you can add part attributes. And so this is really handy. So let's say I wanna add three attributes per part. So I'm just gonna save settings. And let's see where this pulled up. Um, I don't even see the menu. <laughs> save settings. Identifications. I'm just going to clean this up a little so that I'm can find where my parts just went. Let me hide. Right. Oh, I see. It's because number of parts is zero. So I'm going to let's just add three um, parts. There we go. Okay. So the nice thing about this is not only can I enter my part, but I can actually enter all these different attributes. And, um, you know, so different collections use different part attributes, but this is also a way to kind of build things like preservation history. So, you know, you can say, oh, I had a carcass at one point, it was frozen, then we took it out, we fixed it in formula and moved it to 70% ethanol, whatever it is you wanna track. Um, and at sort of whatever resolution you want to track. So that's also a handy feature. Um, so one thing I want to point out is that, yeah, once you've kind of done all this tweaking, right, this takes work to get the organization you want and kind of get all the customization options you want, you can go ahead and save this profile. So you'll just click save and you'll give it a title. You'll want to have a unique title since um, ultimately all Arctos members will be able to see this profile name. So I suggest putting your institution GUID or something in, in front of whatever it is um, in, instead of just doing a really generic name. Um, but if I go to switch profile, you'll see I can automatically go and look at all the other profiles that are already in use and actually use those. And so this is really handy because you can share profiles and that's gonna be maybe not as useful across institution, but certainly within your own, that means any of my volunteers, any of my student staff can actually go ahead and use a profile that I've set up for them. And beyond just organizing these tables, I'm gonna show you um, a profile that I've set up for us um, 
an organization that we work with where we get a lot of euthanized animals from. So this is Greenwood Foundation, and I'm going to say use. And so once this kind of formats, you'll see not only is there an arrangement saved, but actually I've pre-populated some values. And all of the values that I have entered have this orange square around the field. And it's just a really nice visual flag to show who, whoever is entering data that there's been some sort of alteration, right, of the field. And so it's a nice way to just have whoever's entering data quality check the information that's already present. And so, for instance, some nice customizations that I've done for this is we actually take 18 standard measurements for every bird that's coming through the collection. And so in addition to these six expected values, I've already pre-populated those. And I can tell you just finding all 18 of these values, going through that menu, it takes a couple minutes. So that kind of is shaving off minutes from someone entering that information. Um, I've pre-populated the organization um, in some of the agent fields where um, we want to have that info saved. And then I've also entered standard comments. And so I found, especially when we have you know, newer students or volunteers entering data, it's a lot of information for them to capture. And so I can actually just include all that standard information instead of writing up this protocol for them to follow, I can just save it in the profile. And so for instance, we have a remark found injured, transferred to Greenwood and euthanized. And because this is, um, you know, has this orange square, it's a flag for them to check. So they can also just make sure that that comment is still true. Maybe Greenwood actually just did get the bird salvaged and they didn't euthanize it. So they can kind of know to tweak that um, per, you know, on a case by case basis. Um, you can also kind of embed instructions. So Right now, um, I have in brackets, this is the prep date. So I'm indicating to my, um, my student, you know, enter prep date. This is not going to be the collecting event or anything like that. Um, same here for stomach contents. I have brackets. Don't enter if the animal is fed during treatment. So it's a nice way that you can actually pepper the form exactly how you want it with um, instructions even that can get deleted before they ultimately save the record. Um, Another thing we do, and I think Dusty isn't here, so I'm kind of glad because we, um, we do for our tissues right now, because we're not using containers and barcodes, we do use uh, part attributes in the record itself. So, you know, I have all of our tissues with the standard types that we're collecting already saved, and then I have location, and then I have basically indicated I want who's ever entering data to record the box and the position number. So. Um, this is just a great way to get someone set up and ready to rock and roll on data entry. Um, and then one other thing I was going to show people, I'll just go back to kind of a clean screen. Um, <laughs> this might not be new to you, it was new to me because I'd never played with this feature, but um, if you've never explored some of these little links, um, I don't know if anyone's used the poll feature, but this is a way to clone, nearly clone existing records in Arctos. So if you click on this, you know, you can look up any record by any identifier. Um, but if we just do, you know, look up a generic record, it's gonna actually show me all records across Arct Arctos. And so, you know, maybe if you're setting up, um, you know, MBZ has a host and you have the parasite and you wanna just grab a lot of the same data, um, you can actually click on what information you want pulled into your record. I'm just going to click all of these for now um, and say use. And all of a sudden, you'll see that information get populated in. So it's going to populate things like attributes, IDs, agents. It's not going to sort of overwrite your accession and catalog number um, or part information. Um, it will pull in locality or event information. It's not going to populate these fields, but it will populate the event ID and the locality ID. And from there, you can say pull and sync event. You'll get a message about it fetching data and it overwriting uh, information if you've already recorded it in the fields. But then if you pull it in, all of a sudden that, that full information will be uh, populated. So that's really handy if you um, 
you know, if you're just trying to replicate a lot of the same information that exists in a record that's been loaded to Arctos. Um, so I think that's all I have. Um, do people have questions or has anyone kind of experimented in the new form um, and have comments? So Emily, I've got a question about, um, oh, sorry. If you, can you go back to your oh, screen? Sure, sorry. Your screen? <laughs> Thank Pretty you. Sure. Visual. <laughs> so two questions. Um, first one, easy. Can you edit an existing profile name or do you need to just delete that and start over? You do need to delete it and start over. And okay. in the process of me kind of preparing for this, I've had to do that. So yeah, <laughs> um, basically you can do that really easily. So say, oh, I've tweaked it a little bit and I want to actually save this again. Just go to your switch profile, you know, delete whatever it is, and then um, save the profile from there. Okay, cool. Yep. And then I love this idea of having um, elements pre-populated to help your new catalogers. If you do that for your attributes, for example, and you don't actually have information to put into that attribute field, what happens uh, if they don't enter anything into that particular, that row? So I think in that case, um, I think when you go to load the record, it'll say it's missing a value. And so, um, yeah, so you might even make a note in the remarks, honestly, the attributes remarks where it says delete if not needed. Um, okay, and so they and would just, just go to the, that, the, the drop down and go to, uh, a null or whatever. Right. The that top, top value. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So Perfect. unclick it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yep, Phyllis. I think you're on mute. There you go. Um, we have sometimes been able to save a profile and um, we want to change it and we want to rename it. And sometimes we get a, a cue that allows us to rename a, a modification to the profile and other times it, nothing happens. Is it saving? In other words, can you edit a profile and just click save profile and does it save it or does it always create a new profile? It always creates um, a new profile. Um, I will say though, in preparing for this, so Let's just see, actually, I'll show you. It, there is a memory to this. So like if I click on my herp record, you'll see, um, you know, so this has the part extras and things that I just showed you. This isn't how I had my record originally when we came into this form. So there's a bit of memory there, but yeah, you'll have to ultimately delete um, and resave it. Um, so if you and, click on save profile right now, what would it wouldn't do would it wouldn't do anything or it would require you to enter a new and, name always enter a new name so basically okay. if i want to keep that ucm herps you know generic data entry form or whatever i'll have to go um first just switch profile and then delete that and then you'll get a i'm really sure and then go ahead and delete and then just rename from there so it doesn't you know it takes two seconds to do but um it is something that if, if you find, you know, as you're setting up, um, it could be something we request for Dusty to just um, have a, a new save profile without renaming. Um, and this is very much still a work in process of progress. So I do have, um, let's see, the issue is 4361. And that's on the, um, if you come into the data entry form, this issue is where you can add additional requests. So um, he's definitely open to feedback and uh, improvement, improvements for the screen, so. Well, I think they've already indicated that over time we're gonna end up with, we're gonna have hundreds of profiles and at least having everything that is your your good prefix first yes. would be helpful. Because right now you can see our, they're all switched around, so, okay. Yep. And it, exactly, and right now, um, you know, even a week ago, you couldn't sort this table. And so Jesse's added sort features. Um, even in the records, um, there's kind of a bring to front, bring to back organization. If you have, if you work in a laptop or something where the tables are overlapping, um, so it's a bit easier to access. Um, I guess I should show just browse and edit um, too before we go. Um, so just to kind of show you this um, extras is basically deprecated. Um, so that's gonna go away now that everything is kind of in one screen. So if you um, 
need to kind of go back and look at any records that you've recently entered, you can either click on the number um, and you'll see kind of the basic information and scroll down and you'll see these extras and you can save any edits to the core information. Um, you can also enter from seed, which simply means that it's going to give you a record um, that has all the information you've just populated and you can go ahead and save as a new record, uh, just like with the classic form. I think today that enter from seed has disappeared. I don't know. Um, that so yeah so um, it's now basically profiles expanded because right before uh, yeah so before if you had played around with the new en data entry form like maybe two weeks ago profiles were separate profiles only allowed you to arrange the data tables whereas the seed allowed you to seed records with um, right. with values but the problem is is that you know if you titled it UCM herp or something it would go through that check. And so you'd get, you know, your title would go away really quickly. Um, and I forget what else was the issue. Um, you, it just, yeah, it just didn't make sense. Um, and, and so basically profiles are, is now the way to just save everything. So um, okay. that's just gonna go away. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah, Teresa says, file an issue, edit profile. So definitely encourage you to take a look, um, find any sort of um, improvement ideas, but it's been really handy. Dusty uh, added those orange squares, um, which is really just helpful for flagging that something's been entered there. So, you know, if there's any instruction you give, it can it can just be check those orange boxes and make sure they're still true for every new record. Um, That's a big help. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yep, Andy. Uh, just that screen you just saw when you went in to look at an existing record. Can you? It didn't look like you can edit any of the extras you've added. You can see yes. that they're in there, but you can't edit them. Yeah, so that's something that I've been curious about. But um, yeah, it, right now it doesn't look like you can. This one doesn't have any extras. Um, so um, yeah, you can't actually edit these even if you click open. Um, so that's something that we might want to discuss with Dusty because um, I've noticed that you know, you, what you could do basically is if you needed to edit any of these is essentially go to take that record um, and enter from seed because there you can add any of these um, extras or update the values, save it as a new record. So basically you would have to write delete um, right here to delete that yep. and then redo it. But there's probably a better, a more you efficient can also way. Yeah, you could also just load the core record. Um, and then those extras will go into the little extra loader and just sit there. And you could download them, edit them, re-upload them, and, which is kind of a pain, but. Yeah, yeah. That's well done. Cool, um, thanks. Yep, and for those of you who haven't kind of loaded extras, so let's just say, um, let's just say you're ready to, to load all selected records. Um, if you put in a lot of these extras, you can just, you can, yeah, auto load the core first if you want, and then the extras. But if you actually just say auto load extras, it's going to pull the core in at the same time. All right, who else has hand raised? Marielle? Yeah, that was my question. What was the process for getting the extras in? Yes. If you say auto load core and you want to load the extras later, do you have to go in separate bulk loaders? Um, no, you can actually just, if you want to load them all at once, just do auto load extras and it will do the core and extras at the same time. Um, if you want to time them differently, I'm not sure why you would, but um, you can do them separate. So auto load core first and then extras. Yeah, so, but to load the extras, you do have to go to the individual um, little bulk load tools to load them. Right, so that would be... That could be potentially confusing if you thought you'd loaded everything. Um, 
maybe we should have auto load core plus extras <laughs> as an option. But that is essentially what it does because I've I've done this. Now. Yeah, that's what auto load extras does. It it yeah. loads everything for you. But we but should that just does, that's not what it says. It. So just yeah. make it turn change the terminology text. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, thank you. Yep, Phyllis. Phyllis, your hand is raised, but I don't know if you still have a question or if that's from last time. Nope. Any other last things before we wrap up? Um, so great. Thanks for everyone for joining. Um, I'm just going to paste um, the link to Bionomia uh, in the chat. Again, we're going to um, have David Shorthouse with us next time on April 12th, same time. I'll send out the Zoom link about a week ahead of, of time, but um, he'll be talking about Bionomia and how Arctos data gets piped in there. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Good to see y'all.